chapter 4 of Philippians. So the heart of it is so that you guys learn how to kind of walk through a book of the Bible, and rather than just reading it and getting over it and moving on, you can actually like dissect it and understand what it means, what the themes are, what the context is. So we're going to be walking through that today. But before we get started, I'm going to go ahead and pray for us. So, hey God, how you doing? I just want to say thank you so much for the opportunity to hang out with these freshmen and sophomores today. I pray that, like I say every time, this is not about me. I pray that I just act as a mirror to reflect you to these students. I pray that anything that I'm not supposed to say or is not supposed to resonate just washes away and they never remember it. I pray anything that you want to use to encourage or convict that you do that. Thank you, God, for your presence, for your peace that we're going to be talking about today. Amen. Amen. Alrighty, so we're gonna be starting with Philippians 4. If you don't have a Bible, I highly encourage with this kind of a service, uh, this kind of a series, to have it in front of you, with that physical copy. Now, if you don't have one, don't fret. We have ones back there for you. So you can go grab one, and there's Bibles. You can honestly take them home if that's not allowed. You can have Hayden yell at me. But take one, mark it up, write in it. We're gonna be underlining, highlighting. There's pens, there's highlights, highlighters, highlighters, well, uh, highlighters if you need them. But I know that Hayden does this little thing where he goes, if you're there, say preach. preach. If you're not, say hold on. Period. Okay, before we get into it, I'm going to just give a little bit of a background on, like I said, my style of teaching is really similar to this. So I'm really excited. The way that I kind of read through scripture usually is I go through it. There's either the days where I'm like, I just need to get the word of the Lord in my brain somehow, some way. And I have no time. And I feel bad about that. And I shouldn't feel bad about that. But I do. But it shouldn't be on checklist. And that, that, that whole battle that goes on in our minds. Those days, I just sit and I read and I hope I address it in some way. But then there's also times where I do things like this, where I sit down and I like to go through the minimum of three times. First read through, I am literally just reading it and I'm doing that thing most likely where I literally, lights on, head empty, nothing actually got in here. Second time, I'm making notes. If I see something that I'm like, what is that? Question marks, if I'm Thinking something's important, underlining, if I want to go back for something because I'm too lazy to search it in that moment, circling, highlighting, whatever that may be. And then the third run through, usually a couple other runs after that if I have the time, I'm actually doing the work. I'm searching things. I've got some great resources for you if you're like, how do I even do this? Come talk to me after. I can point you in the right direction of things to look at because there's a lot of whack information on the internet. Um, so I highly recommend maybe don't go straight to TikTok with your questions. <laughs> Can be a great resource at times, maybe not the main resource to lead to. But come talk to me if you have questions on that. But kind of going through what we've been going through, Hayden week one talked on Philippians one, which was that pain has a purpose. And not only does it have a purpose, but it also might not only be for your own personal gain, it might be for something different. Moving on from there, we talked about having the joy in the midst of that pain. We're gonna kind of touch on that a little bit more today. So, so fun, so fresh. Going on to week two, Hannah talked about the unity we have under Christ. We're also gonna talk about that. 
And then week three, Philippians three, is kind of about how everything is not considered important anymore when you are under Christ. Everything that was of this world that we found to be the utmost importance, those things can still be fun and great, but Philippians 3 talks about how it's none of that matters and ends with kind of a gospel message at the end. And that's where we find ourselves at Philippians 4. Something I want to touch on that Hayden touched on week one is that the overall theme of this book is that the purpose of the book of Philippians is to serve to advance the gospel. If you don't have that written down, I recommend somewhere, anywhere, write down, serve to advance the gospel. Paul has been encouraging the church of Philippi to have Christ at the center of their lives through this entire letter. So now we're going to be starting with 4-1. Therefore, and ladies and gentlemen, we've arrived at our first stop. We're going to pause. You're going to hate me a lot. We're really going to be like, oh, oh, we're going, we're going, freeze. Oh, oh, we're going, we're going, freeze. We're going to do that a lot. So I don't cry about it. But regardless, <laughs> just kidding, with peace and love. So therefore, North Coast has a very common phrase that we use, which is what is the therefore, therefore. I'm sure you've probably heard it. If you haven't, you will someday, and you are today. So I think you can circle therefore, and next to that, you can just write the word gospel. G-O-S-P-E-L, gospel. This, I want to remind you, this whole book is a letter. So keep in mind, when Paul was writing this, the numbers did not exist. There was not a chapter one, there was not a chapter two, three, four. Those weren't there. It was a thorough letter all the way through to this people, this church of Philippi. So for them, they have just read what we read as chapter three. They're fully aware of what he just said. So something to point you back to is that he's ending chapter three with, therefore, since Christ died for you and, and you have, oh my gosh, sorry. <laughs> therefore, since Christ died for you and you have a citizenship in heaven. He talks about the citizenship in heaven, he says, so then, therefore, do ABC. E, get it? You guys just did the ABCs. So fun. Anyways, moving on. So chapter four is opening with this idea of because you have this citizenship in heaven, you have this gospel, do these things. If we don't start with the understanding of the gospel and how Christ died for you and lives in you, none of this matters. Nothing that it tells you to do matters. All you are working on at that point is good morality. And that is not going to get you to heaven. And if you're spicy about that, come talk to me. I would love to have that conversation with you. But going on with verse 4, verse 1. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, and crown, and crown, stand firm in the Lord this way, dear friends. You can go ahead and underline who I love and long for, and then circle joy and crown. I want to make a note here that Paul knows these people. He was on his second mission trip from Antioch, and he was among these people of Philippi. He had a relationship with them. He knew them intimately. He knew them. He has a right to speak into their lives right now. I don't know if you guys have ever known someone. <laughs> I'm kind of outing myself because I naturally want to be this person. And I work on it a lot. Thank you, therapy. <laughs> Anyways, so the person who kind of without any, maybe you're not even having a conversation with them. Maybe they're just looking in on your life and they're like, why are you doing that? You don't have a right to do that. I don't like that you're doing that. I don't like your clothes. Those jeans suck. Or whatever it may be. Or maybe it is somebody who has a, a relationship with you in your life, but you're not asking for the advice, and they just keep talking, and they're like, and they're like yappers. I am a certified yapper, and I'm working on it. With that, I think there is gifting in the yapper gift when it comes with relationship and an open door to be allowed to have this word that we call accountability. Open doors are necessary for that accountability. Paul has that open door here. He has a right to speak into these people's lives. <laughs> the first point we're going to talk about today, you can write this down if you're taking notes. Allow Christian voices in your life to have weight. Allow Christian voices in your life to have weight. If you do not have any Christian voices in your life, get some. I encourage you to get some. With that, you have so many resources. Sophomores, you have the entire 910 staff, whom I know very well and trust them wholeheartedly. And I'm sure you love them way more than us that are here today because we are strangers to you today. Lean into them. 
They want to be along, they want to walk alongside you in this journey of your high school experience. Ask them to meet for coffee, hang out with them. Now, for you juniors, not juniors, I guess freshmen, I meant freshmen, so you're becoming sophomores. Sophomores going up to juniors, you have us, which I know that's really scary right now, maybe, because like I said, you don't know really, you don't really know us. We don't have any weight in your life right now. We don't have that relationship that Paul is, he has, that backbone of relationship that he has. But what I can say is you may be leaving this ministry, but you're not saying goodbye forever. They're across the lawn. If you don't trust us yet, I encourage you, it's not about us. Lean into the staff that's here still. And hopefully, eventually, one day, you will learn to trust us and come to us, and we are here for you when that day is here. But find those Christian voices because you're going to need them. You're going to need them to finish your high school experience, and you are definitely going to need them walking into your adult life. Now, if you are a Christian voice, let's say you've been doing this thing for a little bit, maybe you lead in a younger ministry, maybe you have friends that are walking alongside this with you, maybe you are the yapper, like myself. Be quick to listen and flow to share that voice. We're gonna be talking about a lot of things today, things like fear, feeling anxious, being grateful in the midst of those things. A lot of these things involve correction naturally, the thing about correction is that when we run so fast to correct and fix, we often forget to listen and see. We forget gentleness, and we forget to enter in with love. I am guilty of that. I want to just get straight to the point because in my eyes, correction is love, but I think they have to still go hand in hand. Continuing with verse 2. I plead with, okay, I, y'all, I have looked up so many explanations on how to pronounce these names, but we're just gonna go for it because they're not here. So I plead with Eodia and I plead with Syntyche. If that's not their names, they can cry about it. Talk to them in heaven, maybe, I don't know. I plead with Eodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my coworkers whose names are in the book of life. Y'all, who the heck is Yodia and Sintai? I don't even know how to say their names. Why do they matter? This is the only time they're mentioned in the Bible ever. I didn't know why they mattered. This was one of those moments where I put a question mark. I said, what? I've literally been doing this thing for quite a while. I work in ministry and I don't know who these women are. I don't even, I didn't even know they were women at that point. As I looked into it, I found out there are two women who Paul knew intimately from when he was doing his missionary work. So when he was in Philippi, he was doing ministry alongside these two women. And there's also understanding or like a belief among theologians that they were also a part of that first church that was created in Acts 16. Because that verse kind of talks about how it's a group of women studying the word and kind of starting up that church there. That is like an arguable thing, but it was interesting when I learned it, so I wrote it down. Regardless, the girlies are fighting. They're fighting. They're getting at it. They're going at each other. So another point for you guys to write down is, rather than taking sides, Paul points to unity. Rather than taking sides, Paul points to unity. Paul doesn't approve of either of the girls' arguments. He doesn't encourage them to keep arguing. He doesn't say, you're right and your theology is sound, so you guys keep fighting because she's right and we need to agree with her. He doesn't give them that. What he does and says is he encourages them to be of the same mind of the Lord. He's reminding them that although they may disagree on literally everything in their lives, do we know some people like that? We walk in our classrooms, we walked into this room, I don't know if y'all do, but I definitely know some people that I, do, I disagree with everything on every opinion that they ever share, ever. It's so common right now. It's like a huge hot point. But Paul is encouraging them that, although you may disagree on literally everything, the one thing you do agree on is Christ, and that's all that matters. Period. You may have no agreements on everything, but you are in unity in Christ, because you both agree he came and died on a cross for your sins, sent by his Father, pay a price that you could never have paid. So he goes on, off the voice crack, that was crazy. He goes on and continues to encourage the others to help these women. You here today 
are a community of freshmen and sophomores. You are the people that Paul would be talking to in this moment to help these women. That means it's when it's really easy for the community to choose which one they want to agree with and add to that divisiveness, add to that disagreement, he's encouraging them, point them back to the Lord. Don't feed into this disagreement because all it's going to do is cause division. And who wants to look in on a community and see division when they can experience that in the world? Gossip and bickering will spread like wildfire and kill a healthy and thriving community. I promise. I promise wholeheartedly gossip and bickering will do that. What begins as two people simply disagreeing could quickly lead to choosing sides, and it ruins everything. It ruins everything you could have worked for in building a safe place for people to live, for people to experience God's love. Continuing with verse four, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. You can underline verse four, rejoice in the Lord always. You can highlight or circle, you don't have a highlighter, gentleness. Like Hayden said in week one, we find joy in the midst of pain and struggle. An encouragement to you as you go through this is to remember the Lord is near. There's a reason, like I said, Paul opens with pointing back to the gospel he just talked about. Because you, this is gonna be hard. We're gonna naturally want to fight. We're gonna naturally want to cause division. We're gonna naturally want to do these things he's talking about. And the only thing, the only one who can help us not do that is the Lord. And so he's constantly reminding them the Lord is near. Now I have a question for you, not so much a question, it's like a rhetorical, so you don't have to answer right now. But if you feel like you look at on your life, and you don't see gentleness portrayed, you don't see it in your day-to-day, -day. the way you speak to people, you don't see it in your actions, you don't see it in your friendships. Maybe you're like, I'm I'm the tough kid, because I say that not like putting you down, because I was that, I'm gonna talk about it in a second. I don't care about relationship, I don't care if I hurt people's feelings, whatever that may be. I want you to ask yourself a couple questions. You don't have to do it like out loud right now. That'd be a little bit weird. But later, one, have you rejoiced in the Lord? Have you taken moments to pause your mind and look around at the beauty of creation around you and acknowledge that there is a creator who created it? That same creator created you. Have you taken a moment to pause and just think about that, ponder on that? And two, have you been convinced that armor is strength? This is what I was talking about. Because for a really long time, I was convinced that armor was strength. I grew up in an abusive home growing up. I'm not gonna get into it a lot right now, but I'm more than willing to talk about it. If anyone has similar experiences or questions, please come talk to me. But I grew up in an abusive home, and because of that, little Fabiana, <laughs> little four or five year old and younger, Fabiana had to learn how to develop these skills to simply survive in that environment. One of those skills is that I kind of picture it as like little Fabi sitting at a table coloring and trying so hard to stay in the lines. Meanwhile, there's like yelling and everything going on around her. Something a child should never have to deal with. In that, that turned into when I go into my life, when I go into my classroom, when I go into my friendships, into my workplace, into possible relationships one day, I don't trust people, I'm not letting them in, I don't believe that they're gonna be kind to me, so why even be kind to them? It turned into all these things. And what that did is it built a wall around me that was thicker than a snicker and basically crushed me. The wall fell in. The wall started to crush the joy that existed in me. Until I learned this, through a lot of therapy and a lot of help from mentors, that true strength comes from God, not from any wall or facade I put up around myself. Again, true strength comes from God, not from any wall or facade I put up around myself. When we stop shutting off from the world around us because the world hurts us, because we learn, then we learn that God is near. We learn that there is so much to rejoice in, even in the midst of the hurt, the pain, the trust issues, the trauma, the fighting, whatever that may be, there is reason to rejoice in the midst of it. You don't have to be past that pain to experience that joy. You can do it smack dab in the middle. 
Continuing to verse six, <clears throat> it says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You can go ahead and highlight, do not be anxious about anything, or underline, that's fine too. And then underline peace of God. And then next to it, in the margin, you can write, remember gentle, and Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30. So write, remember gentle, and Matthew 11, verse 28 and 30. I think I often read so many parts of the Bible, <laughs> it's not even just this one, so many, and I immediately read it with the tone of anger and annoyance, because I think that's what I naturally lean into in moments where I'm like, don't be anxious, just stop, you're gonna be fine. I talk to myself that way in my really low parts and moments, I maybe talk to my friends that way. I often have to pause and I have to read scripture again and ask myself, am I reading this in the correct tone? I think that's important when you're reading scripture. Ask yourself constantly, am I reading this in the correct tone? I wonder how it would change this passage for us all if we read it from the voice of a concerned father who wants their child to let him carry the burden of their fears and worries rather than an angry parent who is just upset that they disobeyed them. That's a hard thing, a switch to flip in your mind. I'm still working on it, so. Let me know if you get to the end of success before I do. Anyways, Matthew 11, verse 28 says, you don't have to turn this, we're not gonna stay there long, but come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I don't know if you guys know what a yoke is. I feel like we talk about it sometimes a lot, but then all the other times never at all. A yoke is basically, not an egg, don't get hungry. A yoke is basically, this wooden thing, contraption, that would go across the neck of two animals, their ox. I don't even really know what breed of the animal an ox is. Is it of the cow family? Aaron? Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Great. It's two ox who are carrying basically like a cart of goods behind them, and it's a heavy cart. It's a heavy, heavy cart because people don't want to carry it. And so they have this wooden plank across their shoulders and they're carrying it. And the Lord is saying, I am that ox next to you and I'm helping you carry this but my burden is light. He's taking on a majority of the weight. He wants to take on that weight of that yoke. Jesus takes the weight of not only our sin, but our hurt, our worry, our anxieties. And although that does not mean we won't experience those hurts and worries and anxieties, he offers to take on the weight of the pain so that you can still experience that joy in the midst of it. He lifts it up so you can keep your head above water. Now, something I think it's really important to touch on, and I was debating whether I was gonna do it or not, and if you guys wanted to talk about it, but I, you guys are getting older. You're gonna, sophomores are becoming juniors and upperclassmen, freshmen are becoming sophomores, like, you can handle that, but we're gonna talk about anxiety disorder a little bit. I think sometimes, with this verse, it can turn into, let's just pray the anxiousness away. We're not doing that right now. <laughs> we're not talking about that, that's not what this verse is talking about. I'm not saying pray mental, mental illness away. What I am saying is if you have a disorder that causes a chemical imbalance in your mind and in your body and you cannot stop the anxiety, you 100% have control over the next part of this verse, which says in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. You have control over that. Even in the midst of feeling like you are weighed down by this chemical imbalance in your mind, you have the ability to do that, which should be so freeing. As verse seven promises, when you do that, the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That basically means this peace, I know we're, you could even sit there and be like, what are you even talking about? How am I supposed to experience peace, peace in the midst of that? Transcends all understanding. We don't get it. We don't understand this peace of God that can come into our lives in the midst of these trials, but it's there. You can write down, your peace is not dependent upon your maturity or your circumstances. Again, your peace is not dependent upon your maturity or your circumstances. Your peace is dependent upon 
Christ's presence in your life and his sacrifice for you on the cross. Continuing on to verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put, in the, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Who is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy? Who? Who is that? Who fulfills that? Jesus. Period. Let's go. Period. With that, underline that entire verse 8, all of verse 8, and you can write in the margin, only God, only Jesus. The next point would be focus on God and practice surrender. Focus on God and practice surrender. Surrender, I feel like, is this concept that like gets kind of murky, like dirty pond water. <laughs> it gets this kind of like, or like the beach water that we have here in California because ours is gross. But all it is is to cease resistance and to submit to authority. Cease resistance and submit to authority. I'm often so caught up in the whirlwind in my mind of like everything that I don't even realize I'm resisting God's aid. I'm resisting his help in my life, and I'm refusing to surrender my wants and my desires to him. I don't know if you guys do this, but I often will be like telling my friends, like, I definitely pray about it. Like, I don't know why he's not acting. I don't know why he's not doing this. I don't know why I'm not experiencing the peace. I, the peace, I prayed about it. I prayed about it. But really all I did was think about it. Like, a lot. The next point is worrying and overthinking is not the same thing as prayer and surrender. Worrying and overthinking is not the same thing as prayer and surrender. Continuing to verse 10, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who strengthens me. It's believed, I was looking it up a little bit, and I kind of already knew this, but I just wanted to make sure, because fact-checking is great. Paul is looked at as probably being like pretty well-off, pretty wealthy when he was not pushing the gospel. So as Saul, he was pretty wealthy. He was he had multiple citizenships, which was seen as great. He had a upper class education. Like all of these things pointed to him having high class. So he knows what it's like to be wealthy. He knows what it's like to have much. This man went from wealth and status and notability to a prison cell. He's writing this from a prison cell, and yet he can say, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I don't know about you, but I am not content in every circumstance or situation. I am literally just a girl. I break my nail and I'm upset about it for at least an hour. I remember I want Chick-fil-A and then I realize it's Sunday and that ruins my day. Like, I'm not content in every circumstance or situation. And yet, I think I know what Paul is talking about here. I don't think he means that he enjoyed being in a prison cell. I don't think he means that he would want and willingly from birth say, I want to be in a prison cell one day. I think he means that no matter where, what, when, how, why, he's able to spread the gospel. And he does. He converts Roman guards. That's literally crazy. The people who are keeping him in that prison cell, he talks to them about Jesus and he converts them. Someone's mean to me that day and I don't even want to talk to them about Jesus and convert them. That's crazy. That's literally bonkers. However, Paul can find contentment in any circumstance because he knows that his spot is promised in heaven. He doesn't need contentment here. He doesn't need these people to treat him well. He knows he has this spot in heaven eventually. And so with that, he gets this courage and this encouragement to go and spread the gospel. 
Then we come to verse 13, which is wildly overused, whether it's like sports or a random celebrity on stage or whatever it may be. And it's often out of context. But here, amid his hardship, amid his struggles, his prison, I know that um, Hayden said he called him prison Paul, like prison Mike from the office, which I thought was really funny. But prison Paul can experience absolute contentment and peace and share the gospel with confidence because Christ, Christ strengthens him. Verse 14 says, yet it was good for you to share in my troubles. Highlight, underline, whatever you need to do for that. Yet it was good for you to share in my troubles. And then in the margin, you can just write, read Job. J-O-B, like job, but that's not the way you say it. <laughs> read Job. I put this in there because the reason that I love the book of Job so much is like I said, I'm a yapper. Naturally, I want to lean in and I want to correct first. I know it's my weakness, I know I have to work on it, but I also know it can be a strength in my life, like I said. This was my, it was literally in my bio on Instagram for years. Mainly because there's also a really funny moment where Job is like complaining, complaining, complaining to the Lord, then he goes, gird your loins, which literally means like, cover yourself, bro, because I'm coming for you, which is really funny. But also because it relates to me a lot in this moment. I love to fix things. Job's friends, there's a group of his friends who basically say like, well, why didn't you do this? Well, why didn't you do that? What if you tried this? What if you tried that? Meanwhile, Job's just lost his entire family. He's lost everything in his life. He's feeling utmost like sadness. Everything you could experience that could go wrong, he's experienced. And his friends are coming in and being like, but just pray about it. And I feel this like pocket of guilt at times that I have to like give to the Lord because I know I can be that way. I look at Job and I say, why would they do that to you? But then I remember I literally do that to my friends at times. But what Paul is saying here is, it's okay to share your troubles. You can write that down. It's okay to share your troubles. There is room to experience hardship and worry and express those things to friends and mentors. And then I encourage you to not let it stop there. Bring them and surrender them to the Lord. Give them to God. And as you learn to do that, I then encourage you to learn to go to God first with it before you go to your friends. Paul then goes on for the rest of Philippians 4 to basically thank the church of Philippi. And he gives his final greetings, closing out the letter of Philippians. And as we close out this letter, while closing out this series, while closing out this sermon, while closing out your freshman and sophomore year, and for some of you closing out the season of being in 910, I want to give a little bit of an encouragement, which like you're going to probably be like, yeah, yeah, we get it, transition, everyone's talking about promotion and everything, but this is real. So like, stay with me for a sec, we're almost done, I promise. Freshmen, you will be leading this ministry soon. You have the ability to lean in to ask your staff, how do I get involved? Join the leadership team, do what you need to do because I promise you putting in that work here with the understanding that Christ loves you first and that's where it's coming from will greatly impact your relationship with the Lord. And not only that, you can create a fun and safe environment where people feel like they can lower those walls we talked about. Because don't we wanna be those people don't we want to be the people where people walk into our environment and they say, oh, this is different. I don't have to act like I don't care about the world because I deeply care and I want to be seen, known, and loved, which is what we promote all the time over 11-12. And so speaking of 11-12, sophomores, you are coming up to 11-12. Don't just lean on the seniors. I, my dream for you sophomores coming in as juniors is that you blow the seniors out the water. My dream for you is that you come in so ready to lean in, to get plugged in, to join our Joshua team, our leadership team, that the seniors then realize, oh my gosh, I gotta, what are, they're doing it. I need to do it along with them because it looks so fun. That is my hope and dream for our juniors coming in. And yes, although it seems like such a cheesy promotion and that's not what I'm doing, sign up for summer camp. Like, this is not a cheesy promotion, although I do have a hand in camps in our ministry. Sign up for camp. 
because camp will make a huge impact on how you walk into a ministry. And not only that, it's a super safe way that you can lightly let go of the hand of 910 for our youth juniors coming in and step into 1112. And freshmen coming in as sophomores, you then can take their place and welcome in these incoming freshmen because we know how scary it was walking into this room the first time. So like Philippians is an encouragement and a call to the church to serve to further the gospel, you can do that in these ministries by leaning in. So let's pray. Hey God, again, thank you so much for these sweet, sweet students. I'm so excited to get to experience them at camp. I'm so excited to hang out more with our incoming juniors. And in the future, these freshmen becoming sophomores. I pray that Man, I just pray you were seen today. I pray that they were reminded of you in a way that they haven't been reminded in a while that it has nothing to do with me. Pull their heart, Lord. Open their eyes to those around them who maybe have those walls up. And encourage them to go forward despite the wall. Amen.